Good evening. Will you please rise and sing one verse of Lift Every Voice and Sing with the Black Voices of Inspiration? to the Purdue University Black Voices of Inspiration Ensemble under the direction of James Deagle. Good evening. I am Renee Thomas, Associate Vice Provost for Diversity and Inclusion. I am honored to be here this evening as we celebrate the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Welcome to a new year and a new semester at Purdue University. This evening is a phenomenal way to start 2022 on a positive, an uplifting note. This evening is curated to inspire and to educate. The Board of Trustees approved the Equity Task Force and committed $75 million to ensure that we provide an equitable and welcoming environment for everyone. The Equity Task Force is taking actions to ensure that everyone has the opportunity to experience all that Purdue has to offer with a particular focus on our black boilermakers. Purdue is committed to doubling the number of black students on campus, conducting a series of faculty cluster hires, and improving the campus climate by championing and advancing student, faculty, and staff success. Joining us this evening as our keynote speaker is a national education leader, Dr. David Wilson, who serves as president of Morgan State University, a historically black college in Baltimore, Maryland. Two of our greatest universities are expanding the horizons of learning, not just in the classroom, but in all aspects of the human experience. We know that a diverse environment is the springboard for innovation of ideas, cross-cultural understanding, and the cultivation of a campus community where everyone can dream big dreams and achieve their goals. Two great universities taking giant leaps together. Morgan, Maryland's preeminent urban public research university, a national treasure anchored in residential Baltimore, committed to pioneering solutions that make a difference in the modern urban environment. Purdue. Indiana's land-grant university, the cradle of astronauts, set on the banks of the Wabash River in West Lafayette, dedicated to the thrill of discovery and a persistent pursuit of innovation. This evening, we come together as we honor the work of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. to set a shared trajectory. For over 150 years, both of these venerable universities have been pursuing excellence in teaching, learning, and discovery relentlessly. Today, we continue that journey, setting a trajectory, looking for ways to support each other, building authentic partnerships, collaborating on projects that will have real impacts. Every day, in our labs, classrooms, boardrooms, and residence halls, 
we are connecting tomorrow's leaders with the knowledge, skills, and experiences that will propel them into their shared futures. Together, standing tall, we can honor Dr. King's vision of a brighter tomorrow. Purdue University and Morgan State University. What a collaboration. We are pleased this evening to welcome vocalist Alexandra Cridslow. She is a native of New York City and is known for her captivating stage presence. Ms. Crislow is a 2019 alumna of Morgan State University, where she earned her Bachelor's of Arts with a concentration in vocal performance. She is an honored recipient of multiple grants and competitions. She has portrayed Maria for both the Baltimore and Philadelphia Symphony Orchestra's production of Porgy and Bess. Ms. Crislow will be accompanied by James Deacon, the director of the Purdue University Black Voices of Inspiration. And following her first selection, Dr. Rollick, Vice Provost, excuse me, Vice President for Ethics and Compliance will present the 2022 Dreamer Awards.
Wow, what a way to commemorate uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. That was absolutely fantastic. Let's thank our musicians again. And I'm what's keeping you from hearing uh, them again. Good evening, I'm pleased to be with you this evening to commemorate the life and works of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and to recognize this year's recipients of Purdue University's Dreamer Award. I'm Elisa Christmas Rollick, Purdue's Vice President for Ethics and Compliance. Established in 2004, the Dreamer Award honors individuals and or organizations within the Purdue University community whose contributions both embody Martin Luther King Jr.'s vision of service to others and furthers the university's commitment to diversity. This year, we're delighted to recognize three members of the Purdue University community. Dr. Deepar Majumdar, Professor of Philosophy in the Department of History, Philosophy, Politics, and Economics in the College of Humanities, Education, and Social Science Sciences from the Purdue Northwest campus. Dr. Karen Bishop Morris, Associate Professor of English in the Department of English and World Languages in the College of Humanities, Education, and Social Sciences from Purdue University Northwest. And Mr. Peyton Stovall, Assistant Athletics Director, Student Athletic Development from the Purdue Intercollegiate Athletics Department from the Purdue West Lafayette campus. Doctors Mumjar and Bishop Morris are being recognized for their contributions to the creation of, of the PNW series on race, racism, and anti-racism, which was developed in the summer of 2020 and launched the following semester. This series of 45 presentations each semester confronts racial injustice through the lens of protest, contemporary politics, criminal justice, healthcare disparities, education, and STEM. Talks in the series have highlighted faculty from all of the Purdue campuses and have, more, have had more than 1,200 registrants. Five lectures, our interactive le lectures, are scheduled for the spring 2022 semester. You can find uh, the entire series archived on the YouTube channel for the PNW College of Humanities, Education, and Social Sciences. Mr. Peyton Stovall is being recognized for his contributions to Purdue Intercollegiate Athletics and the Big Ten in empowering the voices of student athletes and supporting registration and voting. In 2020, Mr. Stovall co-led the organization of a Black Identified Student Athlete Forum and a Black Identified Student Athlete and Allies Forum. He co-led and hosted staff and coaches in diversity training sessions in June of 2020 with well over 100 attendees. 
He also supported private team meetings and the development of a pledge against racism created by the Student Athlete Advisory Committee. Stovall also serves on the Big Ten Voter Registration Committee and the Big Ten Equity Coalition. Although none of our award recipients are able to be with us, I hope you will join me in thanking them for stepping up at a critical moment in the life of the university to make lasting change. They have empowered people to speak, they have encouraged us to listen, and they have facilitated dialogue just in time. Please join me in congratulating them. And now let's welcome again Alexandra Crenchlow as she performs another selection accompanied by James Deckel. Good evening. 
please welcome the president of Purdue University, Mitch Daniels. Greetings, everyone, and thank you for joining us on what is always a hallmark and a milestone of the calendar uh, at Purdue. Uh, over the years, we've been blessed with such an array of uh, historic uh, speakers on this occasion. Uh, Andrew Young, just last year, Julian Bond, uh, Supreme Court Justice Bob Rucker, Harry Belafonte, and so many others. But I would venture to say that never have we been uh, privileged to have a speaker uh, more fitting for the occasion than our guest tonight for two reasons. One, his personal story, which I'm very tempted to tell you if you haven't read it, but I'm uh, hoping that he will share a little bit of it. I'll just say that it is uh, a, a, a paradigmatic example of the giant leaps that we uh, pride ourselves here on at Purdue, of the kind that Boilermakers have made for a century and a half. Uh, just a remarkable story of triumph over hardship and adversity and, uh, and uh, in many cases, of course, discrimination. And secondly, because uh, he has uh, worked with us to craft what I believe is going to be maybe the most important of all the partnerships that we uh, try to foster here at Purdue with other institutions and entities and businesses and so forth. Um, starting 15 months ago, he and I began discussing ways in which our two universities might collaborate. And beginning this summer with a 3 plus 2 program in one discipline, um, this program will be bringing black students to campus, black faculty, fostering interactions, both uh, teaching and research between our two institutions. And working the other direction, it's our guest's aspiration that uh, we can assist his school in ascending from its R2 status to R1, perhaps leading other HBCUs in doing so. And he uh, has uh, held out for me the uh, the uh, vision that perhaps this uh, partnership we're establishing might be a set a pattern and set a model for other schools like ours to work with other schools like his in a whole new era of uh, collaboration for the sort of uh, progress that we all dream of across our entire society. So uh, again, I don't believe even in the uh, long and storied history of this uh, evening and this a celebration of Dr. King and his legacy that we've ever had a more um, appropriate uh, the guest than the one I bring you now, my friend and Purdue's premier partner, President David K. Wilson of Morgan State University. Good evening. Good evening to the Boilermaker family and to all of you who are assembled in person this evening here on the Purdue campus uh, and to those of you who are participating virtually in this event. I want to thank you so much, President Daniels, uh, for those extraordinarily kind and generous words of introduction. I want to thank you for being my friend. I want to thank you for being a friend of Morgan State University. Uh, and thank you for being the extraordinary leader in higher education that you have been for the last decade or so. And I also want to thank Vice Provost John Gates uh, as well uh, for uh, the invitation along with President Daniels to uh, come here tonight. Uh, I am so honored to be a part of this solemn occasion commemorating the life of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. You know, on a personal note, I can scarcely think about Purdue without remembering the late Dr. Fanny Richardson Cooley. Uh, Dr. Cooley was a proud boilermaker uh, who taught me and mentored me while I was a student at Tuskegee. 
Above all others, Dr. Cooley took a keen interest in my professional development, and it was Dr. Cooley who singularly persuaded me to seek doctoral studies and to eventually embark on a career in higher education. She would always speak about Purdue in the most glowing terms as that university that helped her to realize her dreams. And like so many viable universities in this nation, Purdue served as an institutional ladder that allowed so many others like Dr. Cooley to bring their educational aspirations to fruition. I should also tell you that my visit to this incredible institution is predicated on a strong mutuality of purpose. Over the next few days, several of my colleagues from Morgan, from our faculty, from our administrative team, will be meeting President Daniels with their Purdue counterparts here to discuss, as you indicated, our shared interests and to explore some possibilities for more of those shared interests, for collaborative research, for example. More specifically, we will be discussing our budding partnership in rocketry and aerospace engineering that has the potential to forge an unbelievable educational pipeline initiative that will increase and advance the presence of underrepresented minority students in various engineering disciplines and subspecialties. Our explorations are based on Morgan's role as a leader in producing minorities with undergraduate degrees in engineering and on Purdue's role in longstanding commitment to provide graduate training at the highest attainable level. And in that regard, it bears mentioning this evening that the celebrated National Society of Black Engineers, or NSBE, was founded right here on this campus in 1975. And today, it stands as a premier organization fully committed to increasing the number of socially responsible and highly trained black engineers who are doing some phenomenal things in their professions and in their communities. Morgan is beyond excited about this budding partnership with Purdue University because as you heard President Daniel say, one of our top strategic priorities at Morgan is to ascend to the heights of the very high research classifications in this country. We aspire at Morgan to be an R1 research institution, very high research activity, and yes, to be the first, if not amongst the first, HBCUs to ever, ever reach that lofty perch. Thank you once again to Purdue University for embracing our institution along this incredible path. And so with that said, in the time that has been allotted to me this evening, I want to move a bit beyond the emerging Purdue-Morgan partnership. And I want to turn my attention to the significance of the time and the significance of the place in which we find ourselves as we gather this evening to commemorate the amazing life and ongoing legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. To be sure, our annual celebrations of Dr. King are permeated with warm remembrances of his renowned I Have a Dream speech made in 1963. Since that time, generations of Americans warmly refer to Dr. King as an incurable optimist and a dreamer. But Dr. King most assuredly had his fair of critics and cynics, and some of them attributed his dream 
to what they called a perverted form of somewhat juvenile naivety that they say prevented him from blindly seeing and accepting a racially divided world as it existed. But what these detractors didn't realize was that Dr. King dwelled in the realm of possibilities. He dwelled in the realm of hope. He rejected so-called descriptive reality, that is, seeing the world merely as it was. And he focused instead on normative reality, and that is seeing the world as it ought to be. Yes, he was undeniably a dreamer, but his dream was not the product of a passive imagination or a poetic, or a poetic, I should say, retreat from ugliness, from brutalities, and from injustices that bedeviled American society in the 1950s and 1960s. As he so often reminded us, there's nothing wrong with our great nation that is not redeemable. Thus, through all of the cacophony, all of the trials, all of the tribulations, what did Dr. King do? He chose to light a candle instead of merely cursing the darkness. And so I'm often reminded of Dr. King's keen sense of the historical moment facing our nation at that time and his realization that he had to face that moment with bravery. He had to face that moment not being afraid to speak truth to power. Dr. King had a firm grasp of the challenges and social responsibilities of people from all walks of life who shared his dream and who were willing to struggle and sacrifice everything including their own lives, to make it a reality. Dr. King clearly understood, better than most, that the need for struggle, the need for constructive protest, the need to sacrifice were absolutely necessary and they were unavoidable if this nation was ever going to change. Here's the way Dr. King put it. He said, quote, change does not roll in on the wheels of inevitability, but it comes through continuous struggle. He says, human progress is neither automatic or inevitable. Each step, he said, toward the goal of justice requires sacrifice requires suffering, requires struggle, and make no doubt about it. As we all know, Dr. King was tragically assassinated at the age of 39 and did not live to see many aspects of his dream come to fruition. But his work has most assuredly left an indelible mark on our national psyche and of equal importance. His work changed the face and the functioning of American democracy well into the 21st century. His dream remains an unfinished agenda. But his brief sojourn on this earth was not without its single victories, particularly in the area of voting rights. In my judgment, the slow, grinding evolution of American democracy has entailed an elongated process of extending the franchise to vote to minorities, 
extending the franchise to vote to women when so many citizens long ago thought that that fundamental right to vote should be extended to white men only. Now, when we look back on that today, that position, it seems to me, seems almost ridiculous. But as so many historians and political scientists have pointed out, America did not become a fully functioning democracy until the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the act that Dr. King and countless others fought for with their collective blood, their collective sweat, and their tears. Of course, that sacred right to vote was presumably extended to African Americans and other citizens with the ratification of the 15th Amendment to the Constitution in 1870. But as history teaches us, that federal decree was thwarted at every turn by state legislators, principally, but not exclusively, in the American South, where I was born and reared. And they stubbornly refused to uphold that law and instead developed and enforced nine decades, 90 years of suppression and subversions of the black vote. I know I lived it, and I'll say more about it later. Here I'm reminded of the words of former President Barack Obama, who perceptively noted that we are on a never-ending journey in this country to bridge the meaning of our distinctively American ideals with the reality of our times. As he stated, our American truths may be self-evident and our rights may be unalienable, but quote, history tells us that while these truths may be self-evident, they are never, ever, and they have never been self-executing. And that while freedom is indeed a gift from God, it must be secured by his people here on earth. That's you and me. Thus, we are obliged, it seems to me, to actively defend the right of all citizens to vote and to participate in our cherished and hard-won democracy. I mentioned this during this commemorative celebration this evening because, in my view, there are some clear signs and irrefutable evidence of retrogression and reversal throughout our nation. You would have to be, in my view, in a deep Rip Van Winkle-like sleep not to recognize that sad reality. The sacred right to vote is clearly under attack as various states increasingly imagine and then subsequently enact laws that create barriers to voter registration and participation in our democracy. Several years before the emergence of Dr. King, there was another eminent scholar, Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois, who, by the way, was the first black to receive a PhD from Harvard. Dr. Du Bois warned African Americans, he said, quote, the power of the ballot we need in sheer defense, else what shall save us, he said, from a second slavery, unquote. So believe me, voting is not a right that most of us take for granted, nor is it one that we are willing to surrender to the reactionary forces of racial division and narrow partisan politics. Today, the stakes are high. Our ability to vote will profoundly influence the direction our nation is going 
and define the nature of our national character in the 21st century and beyond. To say that we are at an inflection point would be a gross understatement. Consider the ominous signs all around us. Last year, we witnessed a full-scale attack on our nation capital in an effort to disrupt the peaceful transfer of presidential power. A year later, those who planned and executed that effort have been charged with outright sedition. Since the 2020 presidential election, 19 states have passed legislation which impact voting rights, primarily impacting the poor, the aged, and racial minorities. Meanwhile, other states are maneuvering to suppress the vote in preparation for the 2020 midterm elections, and Congress is gridlocked and appears resistant to enacting any version of a federally mandated Voting Rights Act. Worst of all, you have perhaps heard of a recent poll indicating that 58%, 58% of Americans believe that our American democracy, what we have fought so long and hard for, is in danger of collapse. While the alleged perpetrators of the Capitol insurrection promulgate the alarming and unthinkable proposition that we may be headed toward a second civil war. Ladies and gentlemen, as my dearly departed friend and Morgan Board of Regents member, the late Congressman Elijah Cummings would always say, we are better than that. We are better than that, much better. And let me add, much, much better. But we have definitely arrived at a distinctive crossroad in our national evolution. And the signposts are pointing to two drastically opposite directions, two diametrically opposed visions and versions of our great nation. And now is the time, I think, for all of us to sound some alarms Racial animosities and overt violence against African Americans are intensifying and various other religious and ethnic groups are being targeted. The specter of white supremacy is once again rearing its ugly head. And Dr. King's vision of the beloved community is being openly challenged and replaced with a wave of misplaced and distorted patriotism. Rather than celebrate our common humanity, we seem more predisposed in so many quarters of our country to emphasize our biological differences. Consider this, we have allowed our bipartisan politics to lay blame for this current global pandemic on a whole race of people. Uh, consequently, we have encouraged the most barbaric and vicious attacks on innocent and law-abiding Asian American citizens. Consider that Haitian refugees from Central America and Mexico seeking refuge flock to our country to simply find safe harbor and escape the devastation of hurricanes and earthquakes and the collapse of their governments. Yet what did we do? They were callously turned back by American Border Patrol agents who acted more like slave patrols of the antebellum South who violently whipped them at the border crossings. We even began constructing a wall at our southern border to prevent human beings who we began identifying, of course, as illegals from entering America. For, for those who were successful at the crossing of the border, we then separated them from their children and encaged them in a manner similar to the Japanese internment camps of World War II. Throughout the history of this great nation, millions, tens of millions, have escaped dire situations, dire circumstances from every corner of the globe 
to begin life in America the beautiful. That is really what is so special about our country. That is really what is inscribed on the Statue of Liberty. But today, we seem to be saying, you're no longer welcome here. What is happening to us, Dr. King would ask. Furthermore, it has become commonplace for school children to secure firearms and open fire on their classmates and teachers in our nation's schools. You know, today the youngest perpetrator was a six-year-old who fatally shot his six-year-old classmate. The invention, production, sale, distribution of these so-called ghost guns, which I understand is an untraceable, unregulated, do-it-yourself firearm to our nation's streets is amongst one of the top challenges I read facing our law enforcement agencies nationwide. Now, who ever thought that violence would become one of the leading causes of death for children and teens in America. Again, I just ask us a common sense question that Dr. King would ask. What is happening to us? And now, more than ever, we find ourselves in a position to fight for our right to vote. And suffice it to say, that our vote must be defended if we are to shape our national future and create the type of country we want to live in and the type of country we want to bequeath to future generations. Lest we forget, voting is a singular act, a singular act, but it has so many broad ramifications and reverberations because through voting, we get to enact laws to shape public, public policy and to elect leaders who can either build bridges that unite us or construct walls that permanently divide us. This lengthening of the social um, uh, uh, issues is underscores the importance of voting and participating in America's bold experiment. And that bold experiment is called democracy. Through voting, we can extend and we can elevate Dr. King's tireless campaign to slay that three-headed dragon of racism, authoritarianism, and extreme poverty. These things plague our nation and undermine our domestic tranquility. Yes, that three-headed beast is still alive and well, and it seems that it never sleeps. It manifests itself in the disparate treatment of African-American citizens at the hands of trusted law enforcement and judges who have sworn to render equal justice and protection under the law. It mocks the name and memory of victims such as Freddie Gray, Sandra Bland, Tamir Rice, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and countless others. That three-headed dragon thrives on war and rumors of wars, domestic and abroad. It proffers violent solutions that can best be resolved through negotiations, through reconciliations, and through what Dr. King promoted, nonviolent means. Consider, if you will, Dr. King's assertion that, he said, quote, hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that, he said. He said, hate multiplies violence and toughness multiplies toughness in a descending spiral of destruction. And so finally, let us look around and pay close attention to the plight of others the systemic and intergenerational poverty that Dr. King railed against stubbornly exists today. In fact, as a nation, we appear to be steering a course toward greater inequities and a sharp decrease in the opportunities to free our citizens from the ravages of poverty, widening these income gaps and widening these social 
inequities. I, for one, believe that many of these stark inequities can be ameliorated through enlightened educational and socioeconomic reforms. But as always, there must be a clarion call to our better angels, and there must be a concerted effort to meet the demands of just simple justice. This is Dr. King's unfinished agenda. Herein lies the work that lies ahead. And it must be piloted by you, by me, and by others who must stay alert and must heed this call. This is not the time for apathy. It's not the time to sit on the sidelines and passively watch this gigantic and far-reaching drama unfold. We need to just simply rediscover the power of purpose, the power of purpose. We need to rediscover the strength in diversity and inclusion. We need to rediscover the strength in the transformative power to peacefully raise our voice and demand, yes, I said demand more from all of everybody, from our government, from our elected officials, and from ourselves. And let's not forget the role that our colleges and universities have in this grand scheme. I say to my students at Morgan all the time, uh, you are here for a purpose. We're growing the future and leading the world. And you have to make sure that when you come across the stage and you get that sheepskin, that you understand what time of day it is. And that you are in a position where you are advocating for the right thing. And when you do all those things and you've been paying attention, you can bring about change. You can dance on the world stage, create your own moves with the best of them. And so let me just, as President Daniels indicated, as I close, I just need to take you behind the curtain a little bit to make you understand why I feel so passionate about change, why I feel so passionate about the things that I've shared with you. Yes, I feel so passionate about it because I live this stuff. I am the youngest of 10 children born and reared in abject poverty in rural Alabama. My father was a sharecropper. He farmed cotton, primarily. And yes, on many days I had a sack across my shoulder, if you will, going up and down cotton fields picking cotton. And there was no law in Alabama that said black children must go to school, and so guess what? My father, he, he, he didn't send us to school, and so he had this weird system where he said, okay, you can go to school two days this week, but you got to stay out three and give me some help in the cotton fields. And so I was in the seventh grade before I attended school five consecutive days because of that hideous Jim Crow system in Alabama and throughout the American South. I grew up in a little shanty on really what was called a, plant a plantation. You know, two rooms with no electricity and no anything. And the owners of this little shanty, they would bring down to our home, periodically, Look and Life magazines. And they would put them there, not for us to read them, but they knew my mom was innovative, that she was going to do everything she could to try and keep her 10 children fed and her 10 children warm. So we had a task when we got home from picking the cotton or from plowing the fields. It was to take that staple from the center of those magazines. And then she would put this kind of pot of water on a pot belly stove and it would come to a boil. And she would put flour in there and say, David, okay, you, you stir that, you and your brothers and sisters. And then we would stir it, and then she would put Largo, starch, or whatever in it, and then she would set it aside for 24 hours, and believe it or not, it would turn into a plaster. 
And the next evening, our responsibility was to take those pages of Look and Life magazines and plaster them against the wall of this darn little shanty in rural Alabama to keep the cold wind out. And so when I would come home from picking cotton, I would grab a little kerosene lamp, and I started going around the walls of that little shanty, reading. I went all over the world without ever leaving the confines of that little shanty. And I began to understand there was a wide world out there and that I needed to think about that world beyond picking cotton every day. And so when I was in the sixth grade, my sixth grade teacher was the late Mrs. Luvinia Abernathy Coates, the sister of the late Ralph David Abernathy. And she said to me, she said, David, can you stop by my desk at the end of the day? I want you to go home and tell your father something. And I said, yes, Mrs. Coates, I will. I stopped by her desk and she said, look, I want you to go home and tell your father that if he could figure out a way to send you to school five days a week, you could go to college. That's the first time I had ever, ever heard the word college. And so I raced home. And I said, Daddy, Mrs. Coates told me to tell you something. She said, if you could figure out a way to send me to school five days a week, I could go to college. To which my father replied, quoting him, boy, college, college is for white folks. And we never, ever spoke about it again. But five years passed. And he saw how determined I was. And so apparently between that moment and what happened five years later, he decided he would start saving for this little David to go off to college. So I got up one morning, August 26, 1973, ready to race out the front door to go to Tuskegee. We didn't have a car. Only way I could get there was to, in the vernacular, hitch a ride with the parents of one of my high school classmates who was also going there. And as I was standing in the front room, I heard some rumblings in my mom and dad's room. And he made his way into the front room. And he had on these overalls. And he said, uh, he said, David, he said, son, you know, he said, I'm so damn proud of you. He said, you're about to do something that nobody in this darn family, didn't exactly say darn, <laughs> has ever done. He said, you're about to go to college. He said, you know, you told me this five years ago. And do you remember what I said to you? And I said, yes, Daddy, I remember, because it was so painful. He said, let me tell you what I was really thinking. President Daniels, he said, what I was really thinking was how in the hell will I ever, ever pay for you to go to college? But he said, I've been saving for this day. He said, I've been saving for this day when I would see you go out that front door to college. Now hold out your hand. And I held out my hand. And he reached in his overalls and he pulled out something. He said, now, I'm going to give you this piece of money. And it is all that I have. 
and this is my investment in you. And I hope you make good use of it. I looked in his face, and the tears were coming down his chin. It was the first time I had ever seen my father cry. And I said, Daddy, I will. I'll make the very best of it. And I went on the front porch, and as the sun was coming up, I opened my hand. And there in my hand was a crisp $5 bill. That was all that my father had been able to save for five years. And so when I talk about where we are as a country, I can talk about it from where I've been. And I don't want to ever go back to that place. That was what Dr. King was fighting for, for thousands, hundreds and thousands, millions of people, dripping in brilliance, but never to have been given the opportunity to taste the magic of what it truly means to be American. Dr. King fought for and gave his life so that that little black boy growing up in Jim Crow, Alabama, could taste the American dream, deny it to my parents, deny it to all of my ancestors. And so I owe him and the other foot soldiers in the movement everything that I have possibly done in my life and career. And I run every single day to make sure that I'm always trying to give my father and mother a return on their hard earn and saved five dollars. As we commemorate the life and legacy of Dr. King, I just simply want us to reach deep down and to advocate for just America, for an inclusive America, and for an America that speaks to everyone. Thank you very much, President Daniels. Thank you very much, Dr. Gates. Thank you to the Purdue University community. We at Morgan, we are looking so excitedly forward to a thriving partnership with this institution that will enable us to achieve some of our goals uh, and will enable Purdue to even deepen its history in doing the right thing. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, what a powerful evening. I want to thank Dr. Wilson for sharing his inspiring personal story as well as challenging us to reconnect to Dr. King's unfinished agenda. As we close tonight, I want to extend a Purdue thank you to Dr. John Gates, our Vice Provost for Diversity and Inclusion, who is the mastermind behind this evening's phenomenal program. Thank you. And also, I want to extend a thank you to Christopher Munt, who coordinated all the numerous details relative to the Morgan State University delegation's visit. And I want to ask each of you, as you go home tonight, to pack your pantries up, because the ACE Food Pantry will be traveling throughout campus during this week. And we hope that you will make a donation so that you can help those who are in need of food supply. So make sure you 
find that ACE Food Pantry uh, van. There is a schedule on the website. And then finally, I wanna thank each of you for being here this evening, helping us to celebrate the life and legacy of Dr. King. Have a good evening.